Rizwan, you outdid yourself this morning. I mean, <laughs> did you hear what he said? I mean, I only wish my mother and father were still alive and they could have been here to hear that. My father would have been so proud and my mother would have actually believed it. <laughs> it is a pleasure. It's been 45 years, Rizwan. Can you imagine what type of student that was coming into my class? It was a hurricane, a wind. It was a force majeure. It was an amazing, amazing event. This one I've enjoyed every day with you, and over the years, it's been great. What Rizwan said is true. Um, you know, when you look at this country, this wonderful country you have, I mean, and you look at the poverty, you look at how far you've slipped uh, in performance, and I, I don't mean to point out bad things, but you have. Uh, my dream is for Pakistan is Pakistan should be what it could be. And I want to just say to you and start and right in line with what Rizwan was saying is people deserve the governments they get and the policies they get. It's your job to change those if you want to change and live to the potential that you could be. That is really true, and if I can just say another one there. Um, Rizwan points to my age. I've been wanting to come here. Uh, I think he's been waiting to get the invitation to me on the sort of the off chance that I wouldn't make it to 81 years old. And then he could say, well, was next year he was going to come? I don't. You know, being 81 years old, you have a different perspective on life. When we first met, we were both young, Rizwan. I a little bit older than you, but we were both young. Yeah. Well, now, now at 81 years, I, I've got to tell you in all honesty, um, you know, it's a very different perspective I have on life. My perspective now is the short, every day that goes by means it's a one day less that I'm going to be here on earth. And, you know, we all are born, we all die. We, none of us are born twice. None of us die twice. Uh, we're all just born once and die once. And when you get a little bit older, you start thinking about the hereafter. And I do, just like everyone else who gets to my age, they think about what they have. And what you think about, it's not, it's, not, it's not depressing or sad or anything else, but I think about how I'd like to die. And the conclusion I've come to is I would like to die just the way my uncle died peacefully in his sleep. Not like the three passengers in the car he was driving. <laughs> Did I pull you in a little bit? And It's very nice to be here with all of you. It really is a pleasure. And I hope what my comments are today can be helpful. Uh, and I'd like them to be helpful. And I want to give you a framework of how to reorganize the structure but let me just start off with a couple of comments about politicians. Uh, whenever politicians make decisions, when they are either panicked or drunk, the consequences are rarely attractive. When you look at crises, and I'm just going to tell you about crises, when you look at crises, that is the one time when free markets are more needed than at any other time. And I want to really instill upon you, free markets are not a luxury. They're not something you call on when a good day, well, let's have a free market day today. Free markets are most needed when you're in trouble because they are the way out of trouble. And this is the one time when governments most enter the scene is when there's a crisis. And it is a tragic event because they make things usually very much worse. I also want to just warn you on, on just these are overview comments before I start, is when people work for the government, they're employees. And this is especially true of professionals. Now, I was in the White House from, 19, uh, from 1970 through 72. 
Uh, I had some wonderful things. I was George Schultz's right-hand person. He made the mistake of hiring me five times in his career. You'd have think he'd learned not to do it, but he kept making that mistake, thank goodness. But um, if you think there, you know, and I worked there for two years in the Nixon administration uh, under George Schultz, and I learned something that I never want to work for government ever again, and I never have. And, and the reason is very simply, when you work for the government, you take a paycheck from that government, and you have a responsibility to that government as your employer. And I'm going to speak for economists in the United States. I don't know what it's like here in Pakistan, but I do know what it's like in the U.S. My colleagues, very famous economists, you know them all by name. I won't list them all by name, but you know all of them that have been working for government. These people will rebut arguments they know to be true in order to curry favors with their political benefactors. You cannot trust their judgments once they become an employee. The reason I never took a job, I never took a job with Reagan, I never took a job with Donald Trump, I didn't take a job with any of the governors that I've worked for, any of the countries I've gone to. I've done it all without being paid because then you can actually say what you believe, you can say what you think is right, and you don't have to worry about being fired having your pay reduced, having your pay increased. It is a very, very difficult task because government people in general tend to work for their employers and try to aggrandize their employers there. I, I, I want to put this to you just out at front as a basis for the talk. And now what I, what I want to just start with you is people respond to incentives. They like doing things they find attractive and they dislike doing things they find unattractive. Incentives matter. And economics is all about incentives. That's what it's about. And, and taxes, and I'm going to specifically relate to taxes, but it's not just taxes. It's taxes, it's regulations, it's spending, it's monetary policy, it, it's regulatory policy, it's trade. All of these are in a bundle of how incentives are structured and how people respond to those incentives. I've just finished my book, which is going to be published shortly, hopefully by March, but it's called Taxes Have Consequences. I wrote this book with Jeannie Sinkfield and with Brian Dimitrovic. It's been my life's work, and the book's entitled Taxes Have Consequences, and it is the history of the U.S. income tax, starting with 1913 when we put the income tax in in the United States, uh, it's a fascinating history of the politics, the debates, all of it goes on. You will recognize every story. It's a universal story that goes through all the countries that have it. You know, and it starts off with something very simple like this. Uh, we tax speeders on the freeway. When a person drives his car too fast on the freeway, uh, we stop them, we give them a ticket, and they have to pay a fine. We tax speeders. Why do we tax speeders? to get them to stop speeding. We tax cigarettes. Why do we tax cigarettes? To get people to stop smoking. All right? In the same breath, why do we tax people who earn income? Why do we tax people who employ other people? Why do we tax companies that make wonderful products at very low cost and have lots and lots of profits? Now, the truth is, we don't tax income to get people to produce less income. We don't. We tax income. We tax employment. We don't tax people and employ other people to get them to employ less people. We don't. We don't tax businesses that make wonderful products at low cost to get them to stop making wonderful businesses, wonderful products at low cost. We don't. We tax them to get the revenues to run government. But what I'm going to tell you this right second is very clear. Do not think that because our purposes are different that the consequences of those taxes are any different than they are for taxing speeders or taxing smokers. When you tax something, you make it less attractive, and people do less of it. 
When you subsidize something, you make that something more attractive and people do more of it. Taxes have consequences. You know, when you look at it, when you look at the uh, world today, and uh, I, I, I gave a talk in Casablanca not oh, a year and a half, two years ago, uh, to the sub-Saharan IRS tax collecting groups. They all had their big conference. I, I was the keynote speaker there, and it was uh, I, lo I loved it. Uh, it was a fun conference, and uh, all they wanted me to tell them is how they can collect more revenue through more taxes. How can we get more and more revenue? And, and you know, th this was not what I did. And they keep asking me, what is our role here? And you know, when I beg you, beg them to understand, is they look at the US, or these looked at other developed countries, and they say, you have all of these wonderful programs, we would like to have all of those programs too. You know, let me just say that they should be not using the developed countries as role models. They should not. They should be using the developing countries as role models. They should look at the US, what it was like when we became rich, not when we are rich. It's a very different way of behaving when you have a rich country or when you're trying to become a rich country. It's a totally different way of looking at the world. Before we had the income tax in the United States, government spending, federal government spending in the US was about 3% of GDP. Today, US government spending, federal government spending is probably 23, 25, 26% of GDP. Back in 1911, uh, excuse me, in 1911, before the income tax, the largest government entity was state, were local governments, local governments in, in the US. State governments were much smaller than local governments, and the federal government was smaller than both of them, uh, either one of them. So it's a very different world when you look at how we became rich. We did not become rich by doing what we do now. We became rich by doing very different things. The role model should be what we did when we became rich, not what we do now when we are rich. I, I want to really stress that. It, it's also really very important when you look at countries uh, to understand what your constraints are. You can't do things uh, if you don't have the resources or the abilities to do them. Uh, if you look at Pakistan, I don't know what your GDP per capita is, but $1,400 in US dollars, something like that, 1450 somewhere in that range. You have a much lower, you have a lot more constraints on what you can do in this country. Understand your constraints and operate. You can't afford doing lots of things that the US does. You just don't have the resources. Uh, if you look at the world here, and I, I want to go through with it, with it, you've got to understand that there are two types of incentives that exist in this world. And I'm going to go through these two types with you ad nauseum, and forgive me for being an old professor. But there are two types of incentives. There are positive incentives, and there are negative incentives. By, by way of illustration, this, the way I like to explain positive incentives, if you feed a dog, you know where that dog will be at feeding time. It will be right there where you give it the pan of dog food, that dog will be there. That's a positive incentives. Positive incentives tell people what to do. People do things they like doing. They do things because they can make money doing it. They do things because they're pleasurable. Positive incentives tell people what to do. But negative incentives are the opposite. Now, negative incentives I'll describe to you with a dog. If you beat a dog, you know where the dog won't be. It will not be where you gave it the beating. But you have no idea where the dog will be. It's going to run. But you don't know. Negative incentives tell you what not to do, and positive incentives tell you what to do. All right? The hot stove. Do not put your hand on the hot stove. The stove doesn't care where your hand is as long as it's not on the hot stove. Negative incentives tell you what not to do, and positive incentives tell you what to do. All right? Subsidies. Government payments for things 
are positive incentives and they tell people what to do. Negative incentives that the government has are taxes. Taxes are a negative incentive. All people care about is do not report taxable income. It doesn't tell you how not to report taxable income. You can use evasion, avoidance, tax shelters, changing of location, changing of the composition of your income, moving to a different uh, or venue, uh, or just going out of business. The, the, the system doesn't tell you how to not report taxable income. It tells you do not report taxable income. So when you look at government policies, always look at it with the overflow, overview of is this a positive incentive or a negative incentive and how do people respond. What I can tell you right now, and I'm not going into this in detail, never, ever, ever mix a positive and a negative system. Never. Never put a positive incentive structure inside a negative incentive structure. Don't do it because you'll get awful consequences. For example, if you want to help single mothers who are struggling to live and keep their children, do not use a tax credit. Don't. Collect your taxes and write them a check. Always use the spending for the positive incentive and make sure you keep the negative incentives to a bare minimum. I, I hope you understand this. And I could go through in detail how the negative, a positive incentive inside a negative structure always fails to achieve the objectives you want. They never achieve it. There are some mothers with dependent children who are unmarried, are raising single mothers, raising a child, who don't report tax returns. If you use a tax credit to help single mothers with a child, you're going to miss that mother. You're not going to miss her if you write a check. And you'll save a lot of expenses. Please always remember, and I'm not going to go through this in detail, but never mix incentive structures or you will have very weird and unpleasant consequences that result. And you can see this in every tax structure around the world. It's especially true in the United States there. Now, when you look at a government set of policies, and I want to go through these with you, the outline of what should be done. If you go to your macroeconomics textbook, you can see the major segments of macroeconomics are the major kingdoms what I refer to as the grand kingdoms of macroeconomics. But I'll refer to it here as just the pillars. It's called the pillars of prosperity, very simply. All right, the first pillar of prosperity is taxation. All taxes are bad. All of them are bad, but some are worse than others. What you want to do in a tax system is you want to collect your tax revenues doing the least possible damage to the overall economy so you can collect the requisite tax revenues to run a good government. You want to do the least damage with that. Now with the limited knowledge we have as human beings in this world, we don't know the supply or the demand elasticities of every single product in the world. We don't have brains big enough or computers large enough to calculate all these by the second. So the first approximation of a clear and good tax system is you want the lowest possible tax rate on the broadest possible tax base. So you provide people with the least incentives possible to evade, avoid, or otherwise not report taxable income, you give them the least incentives to evade, avoid, or otherwise not report taxable income. And by having the broadest base with the least number of deductions, exemptions, credits, and all this other nonsense that is in the tax codes, you have the least places to which they can put their income in order to avoid paying taxes. Key number one on tax collections is the lowest possible tax rate on the broadest possible tax base. So you can collect the requisite revenues from government doing the least damage conceivable to the overall economy. 
Now, let me just give you a couple of examples of that. In my life, I'm, I won't talk about Pakistan because you know so much more than I do. Uh, my, um, uh, the charade that I'm putting on here today will be quickly visible if I talk about Pakistan, but I might be able to fool you if I talk about the United States, so I'll talk about that. Uh, when we came into office on January 1st, on uh, January 1st, uh, 20th, 1981, when the skies opened, the sun shone forth on the planet, the fields they turned green, the animals multiplied, the trees blossomed and bore fruit, and the children danced in the street, and Ronald Reagan became the President of the United States. Oh, be still, my heart. <laughs> oh, be still. Uh, we had a tax rate that the highest tax rate in the United States was 70%. I won't go through all the others of it. We lowered that tax rate from 70% to 28%. Is that good enough for you? Is that all right? Not too bad? We lowered the corporate tax rate from 46% to 34%. We got the capital gains tax rate down to, what was it, 20%, something like that. We, we had a flat tax. The piece of legislation I'm going to describe to you in 1986 which was my baby. This was, I, I love this one, forgive me. But we cut the personal income tax rate from 50% to 28%. Imagine that. We raised the lowest tax rate <laughs> on the poor, the minorities, the disenfranchised. We raised their tax rate from 12.5% to 15%. In other words, what we did was we went from 11 tax brackets to two tax brackets. 28% and 15%, that was it. No other tax brackets. We tried to go to one, but it, we weren't quite able to get that. It came very close. We cut the corporate rate in case we missed the fatties, you know, the, the businessmen and the fat ones and the rich ones. We cut the corporate rate from 46 to 34%. I could go on and on, but that's what, can you imagine a piece of legislation like that today in any country in the United States where you raise the lowest tax rate and lower the highest tax rate and you get rid of all the deductions, exemptions, and exclusions, which we did? Can you imagine that? No, it, it wouldn't get one vote in the U.S. Congress today. But let me tell you what happened in 1986. That bill actually did pass. It actually was put into effect. And the vote in the Senate, you know the U.S. Senate has 100 members. The vote in the Senate was very close. The vote in the Senate was 97 to 3. Only three senators voted against this bill. Simon from Illinois, uh, Levin from Michigan, and Merkley from Montana. The only three. Teddy Kennedy voted for it. Joe Biden voted for it. <laughs> You'll believe that. Bill Bradley, tall and pink, he voted. They all voted for it. And why did they vote for it? They, vote, they all voted for it. And the reason they voted for it, because it's the right thing to do. Everyone knows that a low-rate, broad-based, flat tax is better for the country than anything else. The purpose of taxation is to collect the revenues to be able to run the government. Pillar number one, a low rate, broad based flat tax. Are we all together on pillar number one? Pillar number two is government spending. It's government spending restraint. Now we all know we need government. There's no argument here. But government is like anything else in life. The right amount is great. Too much and it'll hurt you. And too little, it won't help you. You know, what you want to look at government is the same way. What you want to look at is government has lots of things it's supposed to do. And it needs resources to do those things. What you want to do when you look at government is you want to get the money and have the Congress spend it in the most beneficial fashion. And I don't mean just economically the most beneficial fashion, socially the most beneficial fashion. What reflects the morals as well as the economics of this society. All right? And you want them to spend it in the most beneficial fashion possible. When the damage done by the last dollar of taxes collected is a beep, 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 less than the benefit done by the last dollar spent, you stop.
up already. Any spending larger than that is too much. Any spending less than that is too little. There is an optimal size of government. Now, the federal government did pretty well in the US. For many years, this is, comes out of my book, Taxes Have Consequences, in that, and it only collected 3% of GDP. And it still was able to run what was the fastest developing, most prosperous nation and the greatest creation of wealth ever with 3% of GDP. That's what it did. Government spending did not rise in the US. Federal government spending did not rise until the income tax took full hold, all right? So when you look at this, you want to have, number one, a low rate broad-based flat tax, and number two, you want spending restraint. You, you follow me on this? Please. Government is a very appropriate function. Do not be anti-government. Be anti-too big government and be pro-too little government to make it the correct size. Government's like everything else. Low rate, broad-based, flat tax, spending restraint. The next pillar of prosperity, sound money. There is nothing that can bring your economy to its knees quicker than unsound paper money. When we took office on January 20th, 1981, when God opened up the heavens and allowed my hero, Ronald Reagan, to be president of the United States, on January 20th, 1981, the prime interest rate in the United States at that time was 21.5%. Mortgages in the United States were going for 18, 19% mortgages. Inflation was running 18, 19, 20 percent in the U.S. Uh, might I just add, I, I noticed a couple of inflation numbers here as well. Just this, I'm, I'm telling you about the U.S., but please remember, I'm trying to allude to what might be relevant for Pakistan as well. All right, we had had Jimmy Carter before. We had what I call the Four Stooges, uh, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, and Carter, uh, the largest assemblage of bipartisan ignorance ever put on planet Earth. They did, when we came in, we reversed the world. Paul Volcker is head of the Fed, Ronald Reagan is head of President of the United States, and inflation dropped dramatically. The economy boomed, we brought down. The problem we had is the dollar had been spiraling downward in the 1970s. After the accord, the Smithsonian Accord, we broke our link with gold the dollar became an unhinged paper currency and the dollar spiraled down. All right, we stopped it. We brought it down to where all of a sudden the dollar rose in the foreign exchanges. The dollar from late 1978 until 1985, the dollar doubled in value in the foreign exchanges and inflation disappeared from the US economy. Low rate broad based flat tax, spending restraint, and sound money. I can't stress to you the need of a stable currency and stable prices for a good, healthy, robust economy. Number four, pillar number four, regulatory, uh, minimal regulations, I'll call it minimal regulatory reform. We all know we need regulations. You can't wake up one day, decide to drive on the left-hand side of the road, and then the next day, well, today I want to drive on the right-hand side of the road. By the way, when I came into the airport last night, and I was picked up, and the person drove by, I about died. I said, you're driving on the wrong side of the road, get over the... And I, then I, someone told me that in Pakistan, they drive on the left-hand side of the road, not the right, okay, thank you. But, you need to have regulations, but what you don't want is you don't want those regulations going beyond the specific purposes at hand and creating a lot of unnecessary collateral damages. When you look at regulations in the US, we have gone way beyond uh, the need for regulatory reform and structure. We've gone back to where the collateral damage done by regulations is high. I would guess that there are some regulations in Pakistan as well. I'm just guessing. I went through customs. It, it took quite a while to go through customs for what? You know, just, I'm just joking with you, but there are a lot of those. Low rate broad-based flat, flat tax, spending restraint, sound money, 
minimal regulations, then pillar number five, free trade. When I say free trade, I mean free trade. You know, there are some things we make better than foreigners, and there are some things foreigners make better than we do. We and they would be foolish in the extreme if we don't sell them those products we make more efficiently than they do, and they sell us those products they make more efficiently than we do. It's a win-win. It's called the gains from trade. It's called comparative advantage. It's called David Ricardo. You shouldn't have distortions in your exchange rate and in your trade, tariffs, quotas, restrictions on trade, unless there's a really a very important reason. I do not suggest that we should sell nuclear weapons to Kim Jong-un of North Korea. Please, I'm not suggesting that. But what I'm suggesting is that trade is not a tool or weapon to be used against people or to protect domestic industries. It's not. And when you use protection there, now I don't know what's happening in Pakistan, but I would guess you have some barriers on trade. I guess you have some tariffs. I, I don't know, just joking. I would imagine you subsidize some air exports, don't you? Stop already. All right, trade is critical, not only to the economy, but to prosperity. And it's also critical to peace on earth. If you're trading with foreigners, you don't want to blow them up. And if you're trading with foreigners, they don't want to blow you up either. They like the business. All right? I, I tried to explain to this in the U.S. Now, the U.S. has recently become very anti-Chinese, as you probably know. I'm a big fan of China. I was the first American to go to China in modern times. I went in October of 1970, and I was prepared to hate them. <laughs> And I went to China and I fell in love with China. I just love China and I love it. But without China, there is no Walmart. And without Walmart, there is no middle class or lower class prosperity in America. Have you ever been into a Walmart? You see these products. I'm a gardener and they have all these different types of shovels for $19.99. I want 500 of them, please. I mean, they're wonderful, they're high quality. Yeah. And China needs America. We need them and they need us. All of this trade war stuff is really bad for China and it's bad for the US. And believe me when I tell you it's bad for Pakistan. It really is. Now you've got the five pillars of prosperity. I'm gonna add one little comment in there. Number one, low rate broad based flat tax. I did that for Jerry Brown. Let me tell you what I did with Jerry Brown. He's a Democrat, by the way, in case you know, he's the governor of California for uh, 16 years. Very close friend, one of my dearest friends. He was running for the presidency in 1992. And he called me and he said he had a real problem. There were eight Democrats in the Democratic primary and he was polling number eight, and he needed a Hail Mary. I said, well, why don't you come on down to San Diego? And he came down. Um, I got a lovely picture of him with my two youngest children sitting there, uh, and we planned it. Jerry Brown's flat tax. Here's what we did. We got rid of all federal taxes in our plan. All of them, everyone. Income tax, gone. Corporate tax, gone. Payroll taxes, both employer and employee, gone. Excise taxes, gone. Death taxes, gone. Capital gains taxes, gone. Tariffs, all gone. The only tax we didn't get rid of were sin taxes. And the reason we didn't get rid of sin taxes is what is their purpose? Their purpose is not to collect revenues. Their purpose is to alter people's behavior. Fines, fees, the one thing I started off with. All right, these were fines, fees, and I, I jokingly say we Americans don't like drunk people smoking while they shoot each other. We, we, we tax alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. So those, I'm just joking with you on that, but the, we kept the sin taxes, and that's about two, two and a half percent of all tax revenues. And then what we did is we replaced every other tax in the US with two flat rate taxes. One a flat rate tax on business net sales, that's if you're a Republican. If you're a Democrat, it's called value added. 
same thing. All right, what a flat rate tax on value added, just like that low rate, broad based flat tax, no exemptions, no deductions, no exemptions, period. From the first dollar to the last dollar, you pay a tax the same rate across the board. And then another flat tax on, business, on personal net income. We had a couple of deductions in there. They were very small uh, uh, churches. It's really hard to go against God. So we decided we would keep the religious exemption. Didn't want to lose every vote in America. All right. And we had a couple of others that were very small. Non so on the first dollar of income you earned to the last dollar. Two flat rate taxes. Now we calculated this tax at the uh, static revenue, no Laffer curve effect, no dynamic, no growth effect. All right. The number came out, static revenue, a little less than 12%. 11.78% was what it was on those two to collect the same amount of tax revenues. Now, can you imagine? Well, Jerry wanted to raise it a little bit higher, so he made it 13%. So he wanted to reduce debt and maybe spend a little bit more. That's Jerry Brown. But can you imagine if you had only two taxes in the country? No gas taxes, no, no, no any taxes, just two taxes. 13% on all products you buy, the value added, net, and 13% in your income. That's it. No other taxes. And none of them you'd have to pay because they're all coming from your companies. So if the company owes you $100, it gives you $87 and it sends in $13, you don't even have to report it. Right. Everything you buy, you buy from a company and they add in the 13% there on top of it. No filing, no tax returns, no nothing. Can you imagine? Now, it's true if you mow your neighbor's lawn and the neighbor gives you $10, you got to send in $1.30, okay? All right, but that's a small part. Of it. Can you imagine the efficiency of the tax system? Can you imagine what would happen to the U.S. economy on that? I mean, that's where... That's where the tax code came. That's what I did for Jerry Brown. We went from eighth in the race to second in the race. We had that blue-eyed fella from Arkansas. It was 1992 that, you remember Bill Clinton? You remember Bill, he always chewed his lower lip, sore. You know, we had him in the crosshairs. We had just won the primary in Connecticut. And we just won the primary in Oregon and we're coming into the two big ones, California and New York. And, Jerry Brown decided he did not want to win the race, so we lost those two. But we still got the second largest number of delegates in 1990 in a Democratic primary, a liberal left-wing Democratic primary with all those people on a perfectly flat. Everyone knows and wants a flat tax. It's not just left-wingers or right-wingers. It's every winger likes it. Everyone knows that if you make five times as much as I do, you should pay five times as much in taxes as I do. You should. That's only fair. And that's what a flat tax does. You know, if you look at this whole structure there, and, and I want to go through, uh, through it with you there, but these are the principles. Now, there's one I didn't mention that I'd like to mention, and I think it's probably very important here. It's a little bit less so in the U.S., but privatization. Governments should not try to out-business business people. They don't do it right. They put their cousins in as head of the business rather than the most efficient person. You know, they are not good at business and business is not good at government. They're two separate functions that need to be kept separate. The example I'd like to use with you here is Recep Erdogan uh, during the Great Recession. Uh, you know, the head of Turkey. Uh, during the Great Recession, he sold off almost all of the enterprises that had been nationalized in Turkey. He sold off Turkish Airlines. He sold off all of these industries. During the Great Recession, there was one country that reduced its national indebtedness dramatically, Turkey. He cut the personal income tax rates, the highest rates. He cut the corporate tax rates. Throughout the Great Recession, Turkey prospered as never before. Have you ever flown? on Turkish Airlines. I, I, I just thought I'd mention it's a little bit better by reputation than PIA. Just a little bit better. Just teasing with you. You know, it's the best run airlines. It's better than Lufthansa. It's the best one. There's no reason why Pakistan can't do that too. 
and why they can't have those things. Privatization, it's really important. I worked with Lady Thatcher very closely, as some of you know, when she was Prime Minister of Britain, I was the only American involved with her. And I flew over every couple of months and spent a lot of time there. And I was with Sir Keith Joseph. Uh, as you know, Britain had nationalized its coal industry, its railroads, it had nationalized its steel industry, plus lots of others. And Lady Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher at the time, Prime Minister Thatcher, puts Keith Joseph, now Sir Keith Joseph, in charge of privatization. And he used to always complain to me, oh, you can't believe how difficult it is privatizing. Oh, it's so difficult. Wait, 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 coal and, uh, and the railroads and steel, it's just... I said, you know something? Last weekend in Santiago, Chile, where we had done all the revolution there, we sold 5,000 companies off in one weekend. Anyone bid for this? Two dollars? Two, three dollars? Three dollars? Anyone for more? No one more? Sold. Next company. Just get rid of it. Let it go private. Don't worry about getting the most money out of it. Don't worry about the union contracts. Get rid of that business. It's not what government should be doing. These are the where, places where you can go. This is there on privatization. If I can talk to you now a little bit about, about social policies. You know, and, and I've got to talk to you seriously about social policies. Our hearts, all humanity, feels for the poor, the minorities, the disenfranchised, the undereducated, all of us feel that same way. If any of you have kids, you know exactly what I mean. My little baby girl goes, Daddy, and oh my God, I would jump in. What can I do to help? You know, we all have the feelings that it's not always the right thing to do. John F. Kennedy put it beautifully, and I'm going to put it for you here on socially, and I'm going to go through the rest of this talk today with you on social issues. John F. Kennedy said, the best form of welfare is still a good, high-paying job. And there is no alternative to economic growth. That's the only way they're going to get out of poverty. And I'm going to say it bluntly. If you pay people to be poor, if you pay people not to work, they won't work and they'll stay poor. What you have to do is create an environment for economic growth. The dream in this world of ours is not to make the rich poorer. The dream is to make the poor richer. The dream is to lift the bottom, not to pull down the top. John F. Kennedy again paid it, and I'm a Kennedy Democrat from the beginning. John F. Kennedy put it this way. He said, no American is ever made better off by pulling a fellow American down. And we're all made better off if any one of us is made better off. And then the next line he used, which Rizwan quoted here, the next line we used in our campaign in 1980, a rising tide raises all boats. There is no alternative to economic growth and prosperity, period. That's the rising tide. Uh, Benjamin Hooks put it perfect. And I, I'm, I'm going to say this to you, and forgive me. Benjamin Hooks was head of the NAECP, uh, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, which is an old name, old-timey name. Uh, but Benjamin put, Hooks put it this way in his speech. He said, you know, honestly, in America, blacks are hired last and fired first. The only way we're ever going to get jobs and be able to keep those jobs is if there's so darn many jobs around that we have to be employed. What I'm going to say here is the premium, the premium primorum, the first of all first is economic growth to lift a country's poor out of poverty. It's not welfare payments. You know, when you look at the thing here is you, you just plain don't uh, want to pay people not to work. You don't. I, I'm going to give you an example of Philadelphia. I think I used the example with you yesterday. It's a beautiful example. In code, in law, in Philadelphia, a single mother with a child, all right? If that single mother earns $29,000, all right, 
I went through and I calculated how much of that $29,000 does she get to keep, you know, their payroll taxes and other deductions for this, that, the other, blah, 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 blah. And I got the total amount she earned from earning her living at $29,000 of your income, okay? You with me? I then went through, because that's a very low income in the United States, I then went through and calculated what the value was of all the social welfare benefits that this single mother earning $29,000 was eligible to receive. There was something like 15 programs. It was food stamps, she got uh, child care credits, she got free tra bus tickets. You know, there were all these benefits that she was eligible for. And I went and calculated the dollar value of all those benefits. You, you follow me here? I added the two together, how much she got from her income and how much she got in social welfare benefits, and that was her total spending power, earning $29,000 in income. I then said, let's imagine this woman with a child is just so ambitious. She's so, you can't keep her down. Every night she comes home, she loves her baby, she tries to feed them and everything, and then she studies all night long to get a better job. And she works really hard, and she has all the gumption, and she finally, through perseverance and hard work, gets a job paying $58,000. She goes from $29,000 to $58,000. She's doubled her income. So I went and calculated once again. At $58,000, she has all sorts of different taxes, higher taxes than she otherwise would have had and comes down there and I calculate how much she earned after tax from $58,000 income. You follow me? I then went back through and looked at all the social welfare benefits she was eligible for, making $58,000, and I calculated that. Of course, the rule in the United States, the more you make, the less you get. So all of these benefits, a lot of these benefits disappeared from there. And I took the total value of all the benefits. This is the real world. This isn't some hypothetical world. This is what it is today in Philadelphia and everywhere else. I just use this as an example. And I added the two together. What she got after tax for $58,000, what she got from social welfare benefits, added them up together, and it was the exact same number she got at $29,000. That was 100% effective tax rates on the inner city. You are prisoning these people in welfare and poverty by paying them to be poor, and then when they do work, you take the money away from them. It's a ceiling. It's a poverty trap. That's not the way you want to go. Now, I wrote a little something back in 1974. I lived in the south side of Chicago. I taught at the University of Chicago. Some of you may know the area. I know a couple of you do. Where, where's my Chicago guy? Oh, there you are, there, right there. I, I lived in the south side of Chicago. In fact, the story is that when I moved to Southern California, my old neighborhood was no longer integrated. I was the only white family in the place. And I wrote something called Enterprise Zones. How do you solve an inner city poverty problem like we have in the US? And here's what I tried to do. Instead of making welfare payments, which you take away from them when they earn something, I said, let's take taxes away right now. The same dollar value, let's just do this. So I said, let's make it. If you have a person whose principal residence is in the Enterprise Zone, and you have a company that has its office, its facility, in the enterprise zone. There will be no payroll tax, either employee or employer payroll tax, for that person who works in that area who also lives in that area. No payroll tax. If you think you're losing a lot of revenues, Mr. Tax People, you're not. There's no one paying taxes in those areas. You're not losing any revenues. No payroll tax for the employer employee. Number two, no income tax, up to $50,000 a year income, either contributions by the employer or contributions by the employee. No income tax. Again, you have to be residing there. You have to be working there. All right? And then number three, a thorough review of building codes, regulations, restrictions, and requirements to make sure that they're not anti-economic growth. You know, you can't believe how bad the city and county government is in Chicago. If you look at the building codes in Chicago, there, there are 175 volumes. They're all this thick. They've got 800 pages per volume with footnotes, and no one can understand them except lawyers, 
and not good lawyers either. Let me tell you, these are, these are lawyers who prey on the poor and the minorities and the disenfranchised. And all of these building codes, I, I use the example, they're one of my friends in the inner city there, my, the godparents to my oldest child are uh, black. They started something called the Darshiki, the dress plum, the very, became very successful. But you know, another one started frying chicken, great fried chicken. And uh, what happened there, and the alderman's staffer walked in there and said, you've got a great store here, gee, wonderful fried chicken, I can see it, it's just great. But let me just tell you, I mean, I hate to tell you this, but in volume 78 of the county codes, page 364, footnote 97 on that page, there is a regulation that says the bathroom has to be at least 22 feet from the kitchen in any restaurant, and I measured it, and your bathroom is only 19 feet, it's not 22 feet. Just after a payoff. So the guy got closed down. This is what happened. A thorough view of buildings and regulations and restrictions to make sure they're not anti-economic growth. And lastly, get rid of the teenage minimum wage. These kids don't go, prep, don't go to prep school like I did. They don't go to Yale University like I did. They don't go to Stanford Business School like I did. They don't go to the PhD program at Stanford like I did until I finally got a PhD and then I could earn above the minimum wage. These kids learn the requisite skills to earn above the minimum wage on their first job. And they aren't worth $15 an hour, they just plain aren't. So they go in there and try to get the job and they're not skilled and they don't get the job. After being unemployed for a year or two, they become unemployable. After being unemployable for a couple of years, I don't know why, they become hostile. And then you have to protect yourself from them. I, I just want to remind you of one that happened in Ferguson, Missouri, with a young boy named Brown. I don't know if you remember the story, it was world famous where the cop shot the boy, 18. It was just a tragic, tragic story of the poverty trap of the inner cities. Get rid of the welfare payments it cut off and make it so that Joe growth can come in there without being stopped and let them come back into the mainstream. It's really, really important here in this. I wanna go through with you the theory of redistribution and then I'll open it for questions. And this is math and I forgive me for being math, but I'll try to describe it to the way I describe it to non-mathematicians. Government transfers. Your government does transfers every day of the week, twice on Sunday. They take from one group and they give it to another group. You, you with me? These are called transfer payments. The definition of a transfer payment is when you take from someone who has a little bit more and you give to someone who has a little bit less. You with me? That's the definition of a transfer payment. There are lots of criteria. You, you take it from uh, steel workers and you give it to farmers and subsidies. There are just tons of these transfer payments. But the generic transfer payment is you take from someone who has a little bit more and you give to someone who has a little bit less. You all with me? Please. Now, by taking from someone who has a little bit more, you reduce that person's incentives to produce and that person will produce a little bit less. Please, just uh, it's just math, people. It's not Republican, it's not Democrat, it's not liberal, it's not conservative, it's not left-wing, it's not right-wing. It's called economics. It's called math. When you take from someone who has a little bit more, you reduce that person's incentives to produce, and that person will produce a little bit less. By giving to someone who has a little bit less, you provide that person with an alternative source of income other than working, and that person too will produce a little bit less. This is a theorem, this is math. Whenever you redistribute income, whenever you redistribute income, I don't give a darn who you are, you reduce total income produced. Let me just put it in a little bit simpler terms. If you tax people who work and you pay people who don't work, do I need to say the next sentence to you? You're gonna get less people working, 
period. I don't care if you're working for Joe Biden or Donald Trump or anyone in between. That's the theorem. Redistribution of income always causes a drop in total income, always. Now the lemma from this theorem, I'm going to describe you the lemma, I'm not going to prove it, but I'm going to describe you the lemma, is the more you redistribute, the greater will be the drop in total income. That's the lemma. The more you redistribute, the greater will be the drop in total income. And the limit function of this theorem is equally as beautiful as anything I've seen on Earth. If you were able to reach nirvana, Bernie Sanders crying, he's so happy, Elizabeth Warren dancing on the stage. I'm using Americans, but I'm sure there are some local politicians who may fit this bill. If we were able to achieve total equality, where everyone came out exactly the same, there will be no income whatsoever. Now let me describe it to you technically. In order to get everyone to come out exactly the same, so Bernie Sanders is happy, what you have to do is you have to tax everyone who makes above the average income 100% of the excess. What you also have to do is everyone who makes below the average income, you have to subsidize them up to the average income. That's the only way you can assure that everyone will come out exactly the same. With me? All right. Now, if you actually did that, if you actually taxed everyone who made above the average income 100% of the excess, and if you actually subsidize everyone below the average income up to the average income, I will stipulate today, Counselor, everyone will be exactly the same at zero income in the system. All right? This is math. Now, that's what the socialists want is grand equality. Equality is not an objective that you should try to have. What you should try to do is eliminate poverty, but not pull down the top. All right? I'm just going through this with you because it's so important. And I want you to understand that in their private lives, socialists are no different than all the rest of us. In their private lives, they go for the money too. I, I'll tell, can I tell my one last story and then I'll just, Please. I want to just do, I got all excited about this theorem and I love my theorem there and you know, it works for everyone. And so I sat there and I, um, I took my pillowcase off my bed in Nashville and I went down to the bank and I got all these $20 bills and I stuffed the pillowcase full of $20 bills. So we're fat with $20 bills. I tied the thing there, the knot, all right? So I had a pillowcase full of $20 bills. And then I asked myself the question, where is the most Fabian socialist state? What's the most Fabian socialist state in America? And I came to the conclusion it has to be Massachusetts. It has to be. And then I asked myself the question, what city in Massachusetts is the most Fabian socialist city in Massachusetts. Has to be Cambridge. And then I asked myself the question, what institution in Cambridge, Massachusetts is the singular most socialist institution in Cambridge, Massachusetts? Well, it's Harvard University, hello. And then I asked myself the question, what department at Harvard University is the most Fabian socialist department. It's sociology, obviously, it has to be the sociology department at Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts, U.S. of A. So I got on a little plane at BNA Airport, and I flew on that plane all the way to uh, to Boston, um, and I got there in Boston. I then took an Uber over to Cambridge. All right. I then got off at Harvard, and I walked over to the sociology department. Now, I planned the timing of this perfectly. I found the single most momentous moment when Fabian socialist juices were flowing the most <laughs> in the sociology department of Harvard University, Cambridge, Massachusetts, U.S. of A. It was a rally for Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren on the green in front of it.
It's a beautiful day and they were shouting and yelling all their slogans and down with the rich, tax the rich and you know, wealth taxes, unrealized, you know, they were going crazy in this, free college, free, they were just wound up and the audience was going crazy. And there was a slight breeze that day. So I took a little wooden chair, I went up the upwind of the breeze and I stood in that little chair and when they finished clapping and screaming, ah, yay, Bernie, yay, Elizabeth, and they were all just frothing, I opened up my pillowcase and I fluffed all those $20 bills into the air and they floated over the crowd. Within 30 seconds, there wasn't a $20 bill to be found. Even socialists respond to incentives. They may not talk the game, but they play the game. And what we have to do is get a system here that you need to really come back. All of you need to be the founding members because if, if you don't do it, who will? If it's not done in Pakistan where you're missing tremendous opportunities, look at all those babies born this year and they have no hope. Do, do you want that for your children, for your grandchildren, for your great grandchildren, or do you want to all have to leave? You know, you, it's, it's your problem. It's not going to be solved by the World Bank. If you've got too much debt with the World Bank, to fall on it, to hell with them. I mean, don't let it, don't let them dictate your country. It's yours. And you need to bring this prosperity. They tell you to devalue your currency. They tell you to spend more and they tell you to raise taxes and regulate everything. And by goodness, worry about global warming. <laughs> You know, this is all, the, and it's ruining your country. You're enslaved to them. And every, how do we pay them back? Oh my God, the fiscal balance. It's your country, you gotta do it. And I'm gonna stop there and just throw it open. But again, I'm really honored to be here with all of you. I've not enjoyed a visit like this in eons. And I wanna tell you, I am so proud of my baby little student boy here, Rizwan Raji, and all of you. Thank you very much for having me here. Thank you. And I think I've got a little bit of time for some questions, so I've got about another 20 minutes till we have to break. The reason I've been so long-winded is you know our speaker that was supposed to be in the middle canceled. So they asked me if I could talk longer. <laughs> I could go all day. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I'll stand here. I'll just stand here and do it. I would like your ears to be to focus in case I don't hear it well. Yes. So I have a question. Um, is it possible to pull out a bankrupt country just like? Oh, sir, I'm Mahavish Kokar, and um, I'm a manager in uh, multinational, which is Summit Technology Solutions, and I write in national and international newspapers about uh, finance and you know debt, uh, debt issues. Um, so my question is: It is uh, is it possible to pull out a bankrupt country just like Pakistan uh, with only reforms in the tech section? Sir, I'll repeat again. Yeah, I, I don't know what a case is. Is it? Is it possible uh, for a bankrupt country like Pakistan to come out just by tax reforms? Yeah, it, it, yes. Uh, let, let me tell you several things here. These people who have lent you money ha have been loan sharks. Uh, the IMF has done all they can, I believe, to make your country less profitable, less prosperous, and less well. And then they, you owe them the money, so then you have to obey what they say. They're commanding you there. Uh, we had a big problem in the United States, and I can take you back to the U.S. history. It was 1837, a long time ago. Uh, we had borrowed all this money from Britain and from Holland. They had lent us all this money to build all the canals in the United States. Once, when the last canal was finished, there was a cutthroat competition between all the canal companies. The prices fell sharply, and all the canals went bankrupt. Now, the governments of each state had guaranteed all of these loans to Britain and to Holland. Half the states in the United States, well, every state defaulted on its interest payments, and half the states defaulted on the principal. And Rothschild in Britain stood up and gave a famous speech, as did all the other lenders, America will never see another penny from Europe. And he was right for about a year and a half, two years, until the next new investment came along.
and did. You know, what I would do is I'd look at the IMF debts, I'd look at the World Bank debts, and I would look at them very much from a Pakistani point of view, not from a, oh my God, I'm guilty. You know, you must be monomaniacal on your focus on bringing Pakistan into the developed world of prosperity. Otherwise, you'll lose another generation and another generation and another one. You can't afford it. So when you look at these places, you make a decision, what is the right decision to do with regard to the IMF? The people who made you the loans uh, did not make them because it was good, profitable, or good loans. They, they didn't. They made it because they're a bureaucratic team at the IMF or the World Bank making the loans to Pakistan and whole lording it over Pakistan. So I would make a clear situation there. Uh, let me tell you, if you default on those loans, they won't lend you the money anymore and you'll have to do it yourself, which is wonderful. You won't be able to live on other people's. This is your problem. It's not the World Bank's problem. It's not the IMF problem. They could give a darn. They don't live here, they, wherever. It's your problem and you've got to solve it for yourself. It's no amount of money coming from China or the US or wherever it is that's going to bail you out. You need to go back to the five pillars of prosperity to even have any hopes of redeeming prosperity in this country. And I hate to tell you that, but it, it's the truth. These are your constraints. You've got a GDP of $1.4,000 per person. You ain't got the, you know, you need to start at the base. You look at the companies that the government runs. The government runs your schools. The government runs your roads. The government runs your electric company. The government runs this, runs that one. How are they doing for you? Privatize them. Put them in people's hands. Get going. Do it the way people did when they became rich. Don't do it the way they are when they are rich. Please, does that make sense to you? Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next question, yes sir. Yes. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're both standing right next to each other, so I just point. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Uh, my, my Jeanette. Prof yeah, uh, my Professor Lafa. Uh, this, this, uh, Tony Blair used this term, the state became a vested interest. So in Pakistan, the state is a vested interest. I mean, the, yes, it is. the, the top employees in the state uh, get about 100, 150 times the minimum wage. Uh, in US, this is not the case. I mean, in US, uh, the Supreme Court judges get about 20 times the minimum. So did you encounter that? And I, how do we fight that, the state becoming a vested interest? Take over the state, it's yours. The states, it's your country, it's your government. They work for you, not you for them. This is not some massive, you say, oh, massa, please help me. Please give me some handouts, please. No, you're the boss, not them. And you've got to reverse the roles. They serve you. The government is there for the people, by the people, and of the people. And that's what you've got to understand. You need them to do what's best for the people, not what's best for government. If the government goes bankrupt, that's not you going bankrupt. That's the government's going bankrupt. The people will do very well if the government went bankrupt in many cases. For, for example, Afghanistan. You follow what I'm saying? I, I do, but you, in, in the Pakistani context, you sound like a communist revolutionary. Oh my God, don't do that. <laughs> let, me, let me prove to you I'm not a communist. All right? I understand that. Let me best. prove to you that I'm not. All right, I want to prove it. The biggest reform I would do in any country is how you handle government employees and how you handle politicians. All right? You have two companies, Company A and Company B. Identical companies. Company A's officers and directors have very high salaries, they own no stock, and they have no stock options. Company B's officers and directors have low salaries, they own a lot of stock, and they have a lot of stock options. Which one of those two companies would you invest in? The one where the incentives of the officers and directors are aligned with the incentives of the shareholders. That's the one you'd invest in. All right? The problem with government, and it's very understandable, it's the problem with every child that any one of you has ever raised, they're spending someone else's money. It's fun spending other people's money. 
And you don't bear the consequences of bad decisions either. Okay, the problem is governments don't bear the, the, uh, the consequences of bad decisions. Do you remember that movie by uh, Jimmy Stewart? He used to be in our social set in Beverly Hills. Uh, it was Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. If any of you remember that movie, it was a wonderful movie. He's filled and imbued with the social justice and he goes to Washington DC to reform everything. And he, he gets there and he works really hard and the interest rates come down and inflation comes down. The unemployment rate goes down. The stock market goes up. The enemies of America are pushed offshore. The children dance in the streets and the fields and the animals, they multiply. <sighs> what happens to that congressman's salary? Nothing. Now imagine his evil twin comes to Washington. He now comes in there, the interest rates go way up, inflation goes way up, the unemployment rate goes way up, the stock market crashes, children are dying in the streets and the enemies of America are coming up on our shores. What happens to that congressman's salary? Nothing. They don't bear the consequences of their own actions. Now how do you solve this? The two companies? You put politicians on commission. I'm not joking. You put them on commission. If they do a good job, they get paid more than if they do a bad job. I don't mind politicians making a lot of money as long as I do too. So what I would do, and let me just do a hypothetical. If you hit 3% GDP growth, they get their pay. You hit 4% growth, double their pay. Hit 5% growth, you triple their pay. 2% growth, eh, no pay. 1% growth, they have to pay us their money back. <laughs> you need to make politicians accountable in a financial sense. Believe me when I tell you, when a person goes into politics and gets elected, they're going to make a lot of money. They all do. I've never heard of a politician dying poor. I've never heard of it. Now, I'm sure that's not true in Pakistan, but it's really true in the US. I'm just joking, I know it's true in Pakistan. Now, the question is, how do they get rich? I want them to get rich by doing a good job rather than by stealing. And that's why you need to put in, you need to have school teachers who teach better than other school teachers paid more. You need school administrators who do a great job administering the students and the students do well. They need to be bonused big time for their performance. You need merit pay throughout the entire system. I hope that answers your question there. Even if I do sound like a communist to you, it is a revolution. We are all captured by these people and they captured us. We've got to break free from that being captured and I can tell you, it can be done. I've been involved in it many times where it's worked. And it's up to you to do it. You know, and people deserve the governments they get. Sir. Can we take, can we take the questions together? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Abdullah Yusuf. Uh, I would like to first of all thank you, Arthur, for an excellent, your uh, lifetime experience that you have shared with us. Very, very valuable for us. Now, one of the things that um, we have as a very, very basic and important issue from our economy's point of view, it's actually the revenues on one side and expenditure on the other side. Because we run a fiscal deficit every year and we have our you know, debt uh, increasing all the time, which is obviously not sustainable going no. forward. So the answer has to be that we have to substantially focus on revenue mobilization, increase in revenue. Now, for that, we have the problem, basic problem is cash economy, non-documented economy, and people are evading, avoiding taxes, etc. So you are not able to collect the revenues that the potential is there to collect. According to one last survey, 
there's a gap of about 70%. Now, for this, I feel, because you said in America, you decided to uh, finish off various taxes and just reduce them and well, lower the rates, etc., and increase the taxpayer base. That is absolutely right, I agree. But now to increase the taxpayer base with this cash economy, how are you going to actually manage that? Yeah. And it's that a fair is, question. That is really a very, very critical, I yeah. think, issue for us. Yeah. But now the other, oh, sorry. sorry, sorry, the second part of the expenditure side, on that side, we have, uh, you know, the government, for instance, uh, is the important uh, expenditure, apart from number one item we have in our expenditure side is the actual uh, interest charges that we have to pay on our total debt, which you really, you know, will not be able to do anything unless you really uh, reduce your um, losses that we are getting. Now, on this uh, expenditure side, on the government expenditure, basically, one of the austerity, um, you know, there was a committee formed for this purpose by the government, and that committee recommended that we have 42 ministries, and we recommend that it should be reduced to 21 make it half, and that will cut so much of this expenditure. That uh, proposal then went to the Prime Minister, and he said, yes, I agree with this, but then what is going to happen to these 21 uh, ministers who are there at the moment? Political reason, political consideration. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> you may like to Give us your thoughts on your experience yeah. in these type of problems. Thank you. I, I won't remember these. Okay. If I, if I, you know, well, let me, if I can. I believe in a tax system, and I think it follows that all parties in the society agree with. Tax systems should not be in. Let me put it softly. Of course, tax systems need to be enforced and people have to pay their taxes. But what you want to do is have the tax system broadly agreed to by all members of society. Rich people have to think the taxes are fair. Poor people have to think the taxes are fair. They have to think the tax system is a conglomerate. It's not one group taking away from the other group and causing class warfare. The one thing is every rich person in the United States, and I don't want to talk about Pakistan because I really don't know what I'm talking about here, but in the United States, every rich person knows they have to pay more in taxes. Everyone, they, they know it than, they, than poor people do. But when they get up to 94% tax rates, they don't think that's fair. And when they don't think it's fair, they can hire lawyers, accountants, deferred income specialists, favor grabbers, lobbyists, and all this stuff, and they can beat the government down. And that's just what they have done throughout our entire history when we had high tax rates. When we lowered tax rates, the rich paid much more in taxes. When we raised tax rates, the rich got hurt and they sheltered all their income. That's what happens in there. So when you look at how do you collect this money, you want to have it the lowest rate on the broadest base and make it so that people understand that their taxes are going to support government activities that they believe in. It's got to be a compliance, a democracy where one group's not fighting another. It's all of us in this tub together. Now, when you go to the government agencies, there's one way of handling politics. It's just don't do it. You know, people should be head of government agencies because they're competent and because the government agencies help the people. If the government agencies are headed by incompetent people and they don't help the, 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 the electorate, get rid of them. That's why you want to make it merit pay for politicians. If politicians are like CEOs of corporations, CEOs of corporations do not want to keep on losers. They don't, they like to get rid of losers. You want to make politicians want to run it like a business. And so it's really there to serve the people, not to serve the employees.
Now, we have a very funny thing in the United States, not in the federal government, but in state and local governments in the U.S. We have two different models. We have right-to-work states, and we have forced union states. The forced union states, the government runs for the employees, for the government employees. In the right-to-work states, uh, the employees serve the people. And which one of those states perform better? The right-to-work states where government employees are there solely to serve the people, not be to protect their jobs, and they behave very differently. In the union states, the unions take control of government, and it becomes a government run by the employees of the government, not by their service to the people. And it's a really interesting different model. But that's the way I would go on the spending issues and on the tax issues. But voluntary compliance is really important. You can't make one part of your society an enemy and the other part, a you can't do that. It's all of you in the tub together. I gave you the quote from Kennedy, and it's so important. No American is ever be better off by pulling a fellow American down. We're all in this stuff. Rich people, poor people, fat people, skinny people, tall people, short people. You know, we're all in this together. We're partners. And you can't have one fighting the other. You've got to make the policies there. And it's very hard to do that. But we've done it at times. With Reagan, what happened to tax revenues when Reagan's bill went through? Guess, through the ceiling. What happened to tax revenues in the 1920s when we top, dropped the highest tax rate from 77% to 25%? It was called the Roaring Twenties. The biggest boom the United's ever seen. The rich paid much more in taxes and the economy was the most prosperous, but they paid much lower rates. What happened in 1932 when they raised the highest tax rate from 25% to 63%? It was called the Great Depression. And it lasted for 20 years. I mean, these are the ways of looking of how to make a partnership. And that's what I'm trying to instill is that all Pakistan is in this tub together. Rich and poor alike, you all want to be prosperous. And it's not one stealing from the other. It's all of you working to make a more prosperous country. And that's what's really needed. Oh, well, yeah. A very good example was when Putin became the president just after the year 2000. And the first thing Putin did, and he had a very smart uh, minister of finance, is that he put in a 13% flat tax rate. And the, the result was that over a period of three years of installing the 13% tax rate, the total revenues collected by the government tripled. They did not triple in Google, they tripled in dollars. Let me tell you, yeah, this was my tax plan for Jerry Brown. This is exactly my tax plan for Jerry Brown. Richard Vetter of Ohio State University, a friend of mine, who was a consultant for Putin. <laughs> Go figure. Uh, he took the plan over there, Putin put it in, and that's exactly what happened. This was the one I did for Jerry Brown. At a low rate, broad base, these people stopped sheltering their income. They stopped hiring consultants. They stopped doing all of this stuff, and they pay their damn taxes. They know they have to pay taxes and they do it. And that's what you want. You want the economy so prosperous that everyone quits their government job. <laughs> we, have, we have some questions. So I'm sorry, go ahead. Just, you, just tell me who. So we have Pervez Tahir and then Najma. Yes, Pervez Tahir, sir, please. Well, Pervez Tahir from the older Cambridge. Where are you? Well, I don't see him. <laughs> Raise your hand. Oh, there you are. Okay, yes. You have to look left. No, that's over here. <laughs> You're to my right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I'm Pervez Kahat from the older Cambridge. Milton Friedman needed a helicopter, and you were able to do without it. Remember that? I do. Okay. Quite a role call of Fabians. But I think you missed out on uh, the universal basic income fellows and the negative income tax. We did. We did miss out on that. Uh, Can you comment? Yes, I will. I don't like the universal basic income at all. I don't think that people should be given money for not working by the government just because they're there. I, I just don't. 
and we did not do the basic income of Milton Friedman. We also had a very different model than Milton Friedman during the 1980s. Now, he and I were both on the President's Economic Policy Advisory Board called PREPAB. There were 11 of us on that. And Milton Friedman and I agreed on almost all issues, but there were a couple of things we didn't. Uh, we had Paul Volcker as head of the Fed. During the 1980 to 88 period, the money supply grew really rapidly. The reason it grew rapidly was not because they printed too much money. It's because the demand for money increased dramatically. Interest rates came down, the economy boomed. The demand for money pulled the money supply out, not the other way around. And so we had falling inflation, strong dollar, and lots of money coming into circulation. Milton and I had many discussions with the president on this, always on the opposite side. Uh, but the president, fortunately, uh, came in with us. I'm just joking, but uh, you know, you really want sound money. And sound money is its value, not its quantity. If you made a good money, won't people hold more of it? Won't they? If you, if you guaranteed the value of the dollar, people all over the world would hold that money. Interest rates would fall sharply. There'd be no inflation. That's exactly what you want out of monetary policy. And that's exactly what we brought you with Ronald Reagan. We cut tax rates dramatically. We created the biggest boom of all time. From January 1st, now just think of this, January 1st, 1983, when the tax cuts took effect, to June 30th, 1984, how many months is that? Is that 18 months? 18 months, a year and a half. During that year and a half period, the U.S. economy grew by 12%. That's at an 8% per annum compound rate. We grew at Chinese growth rates because of tax cuts and sound money and deregulation. You can do the same thing here. You really can. You can do even more. You start off at a lower base. It's much easier to grow from one than it is from 1,000. All right? You've really got the chance. And, you know, the esoteric ones of putting a person's name in, I mean, when we did the 13% flat tax for Putin, it worked just as well as it would have worked for Jerry Brown. It doesn't care if you're a communist or a capitalist, if you're old or young, male or female, brown or white. It doesn't matter. If you have a low-rate, broad-based flat tax, it works. And the revenues pour in, just the way they did there. That's why economics is math. It's not touchy-feely types of sociology. It's math. You want people to work, make work profitable. You want people to sit home and not work, make non-work profitable. Give double unemployment benefits. You'll get everyone not working. Yeah, that's happening in the U.S. That's, I'm not a goodbye. La one last one, where I'll do one uh, more. Sure. I'm Ooh. over here. Yell, just if, yell, do your question. Great, you have to look straight at me then. <laughs> oh, there you are. There you are. Thank you. I'm old. I don't see well. I've got hair in my ears. I drool. <laughs> You're doing a great Jack Nicholson impression, I have to oh, say, thank as, you. I, as I watch you. Um, you think I look like him? You do, indeed. I, I've heard that once before. I was so proud. I went and gave the person a hug. So come on up <laughs> after. <laughs> I'll come over for the hug shortly. <laughs> it's an honor to be here to hear you speak. I've been hearing about you since my LSC days. So uh, welcome to Pakistan. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, I'm a baby of the Thatcher era, and I fully believe in everything she said, which obviously generated from yourself. In a country like Pakistan, though, following and implementing your first pillar of tax, which is the broadest base possible and the lowest number, how do we implement that in a very poor country where the vast majority of your population is extremely poor? So the suggestion that you should do a flat rate, for example, of 13% across the broad base, yeah. how do you implement that in a poor country? Let me ask you, how many of the poor people are hired by poor people? Uh, I'm, you know, basically, the people who do the hiring in Pakistan are rich people, aren't they? They're businesses. I mean, so what you want to do is create the jobs. What you want to do is make it profitable for, for business people to hire poor Pakistanis so they get jobs and get income. And you got to start with lowering the top rates all the way down, getting rid of the complications and all this stuff. You know, 
Yeah, pay your what? Let's do a 13%. Yeah, pay your 13% and go about your business. When your tax rates are 50%, you spend 50% of your time trying to figure out how to get around the taxes and 50% of your time trying to do your business. When you drop the rates to 10%, you spend 10% of your time trying to figure out your taxes and 90% of your time trying to do your business. What you want business people to do is worry about business, not about taxes. So you want a low rate, broad based, flat tax, so they don't need to hire lawyers and accountants and you know all these silly people who do nothing but waste. Is that because you're referring just to corporate tax though? But what about I'm talking about corporate and personal tax? What about income tax? I'd go flat tax and income tax. Everyone pays 10% of their income. Right. So then how do you apply that to the poor people? Well, you do just the way you do to everyone else. If they make $100, you pay you $10. No. No. No, I mean, there are probably so people that are so poor that you're not going to chase them down. But, you know, everyone should pay their taxes fair and square. Everyone should have a stake in the country. You should. And if you make $10 and the tax rate's 10%, you owe the government $1. If you make $10 million and you pay 10%, you owe them what? 10000 I don't know if I'm that good at math here. But, you, I mean, everyone pays the same amount. It's all fair. Now, you chase them down and kick them if they don't know, of course, you don't do that. But you have everyone pay the same tax. It's your responsibility for being a Pakistani. And it's fair, isn't it? If you make 10 times as much as I do, shouldn't you pay 10 times as much in taxes? I mean, isn't that fair? It sounds fair to me. I don't know any other way of talking about fair. Everyone pays their fair share and make it so that everyone wants to be part. The rich people believe that 10% or 15% is fair. 90%, it's not fair. They're stealing my money. And then they become the enemies. And you don't want the rich people to be your enemies. You want the rich people to love Pakistan and employ people and make better products. And you want the poor people to be able to get their first job, save a little bit so they make a little bit, and they become rich too. You, you, it, it's all together. And I, I just don't know how to tell you, you're all in the same tub. You're not the enemy of them, and they're not the enemy of you. You know, you're all Pakistanis, and you want this country to prosper. We should maybe take two more questions. Okay, quick. There's one. Yes. Azishan, Azishan, and Dr. Talat, and one. Okay, there you go. Who? First one, Azishan. come on. So, my name is Azishan <laughs> you would be out of a job in my country. <laughs> I'm a tax lawyer. I, I'm, I'm, I happen to be the president of Karachi Tax Bar Association. I'm leading that institution for now. So I totally agree with you what you said that the higher the tax rate, the more the evasion, the more the avoidance. The challenge, unfortunately, is that we have 17% uh, of VAT, which is sales tax, and then 30% out of income tax. So the tax rates goes up to around 45, 47%, and which gives you a lot of chance to tinker around it. It sure does. The challenge is, I mean, I was uh, representing FPCCI during the year 2014, and we were trying to make government understand that the lower the tax rate, it will bring you more and more taxes. There was this debate where they were collecting 17% uh, sales tax and they were getting the net amount of more, less than 3%. And we suggested to them that you bring it to 5% flat with no adjustment and no refund. So that would give you more and more revenue. And it would be a hell of a, a political slogan that they will be bringing the tax rate from 17 to 5. They didn't listen and we are still suffering. So the question is that the country like Pakistan where the tax base is very low, we intend to rely on the withholding taxes, which is indirect taxes. How do you get away from that so that people will pay the taxes actually which they owe? The challenge would be then again to reduce the tax rates and nothing than yeah. that. And yeah. then the cash economy and everything. I think the challenge lies whether we are sincere with ourselves or not first. And then you need to make the tax laws easy. You don't make the tax laws that difficult that we meant money. You need to make the tax laws in such a way that a common person can understand the law and then file his or her taxes. And it should be efficiently filed. 
The system does not dodge you. At present, the system which we file through is called IRIS, I-R-I-S. Trust me, if anybody in this room can file his or her own tax return by themselves, it is virtually impossible. I mean, I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it will take you to file at least, yeah, two hours to, I mean, if you have all the numbers with you, you, you will, it will take you at least two hours to file your own personal tax return. Sure, sure, sure. But the, the solution lies in the low, lower tax rates and the easy tax code. Please go ahead. I'm Kala Tanwar, uh, Professor, SBP Memorial Chair, Bhavad in Zakaria University, Multan. And uh, to me, I think uh, Lefrakar idea was remarkable, which was given by you. That's my profile. <laughs> yeah. That's the laugh for sure. Congratulations. <laughs> but you know, can I ask about the empirical evidence of Lefer curve in developing countries? What should developing countries do? The empirical evidence for Leffer curve. Okay, okay. Leffer curve. Let me tell you, I'll take you the biggest empirical evidence is I just finished the book, as I mentioned, taxes have consequences. If you look at the relationship, every single time they raised tax rates on the rich, two things happened. The rich got lower incomes, and the incomes they did have, they sheltered, and tax revenues went down. Every single time they lowered tax rates, the rich made more money, and the money they did make, they sheltered less, and tax revenues went up. For 113 years, every single year, it moved perfectly in sync. Second thing that happened, every time they raised tax rates in the rich, the economy went into the hole. This is the Smoot-Hawley tariff in 1929, then the raising of the rate in 32 from 25 to 63 percent. Then in 1937, they raised it from 65 to 79 percent. And then between 1937, which was the second dip in the Great Depression, they went to 1945, where the rate was 94 percent. 94 percent. You got to keep six cents out of every dollar you earned. Guess what people did? They hired lawyers. They got around it, all right? Then we had a big tax cut in, right after World War II from 94% down to 82%. All right, the economy boomed as like you've never seen revenues went through the ceiling. And then of course they raised the tax rates back up to 91 and a half percent. Uh, when Eisenhower came in during the whole Eisenhower period, we had three recessions, bad economy, terrible. And then John F. Kennedy took over. He cut the highest rate from 91% to 70%, cut the lowest rate from 20, uh, from 20% to 14%. Uh, he put in the investment tax credit, accelerated depreciation, cut government spending, huge boom in the economy. It was called the go-go 60s, uh, and we ran surpluses. Then we got the four stooges that I've mentioned to you. Johnson, Nixon, Ford, and Carter. They raised taxes throughout the whole period. They lowered thresholds, so everyone hit the top bracket right away. The economy really did badly. I mean, very badly. 16 years of hell. And then all of a sudden we had Ronald Reagan, ba-boom. And then we had George Bush. Uh, he didn't do very well. But then Bill Clinton did a great job. Bill Clinton cut taxes like you wouldn't believe. He cut government spending. The economy boomed. Under. I voted for Bill Clinton twice, by the way. I've, I've worked for Democrats more than I have Republicans, just for the record. Uh, so therefore, it boomed. And then we got W and Obama, the Bob C. twins. Did about as badly as you could do, possibly. And then you got Donald Trump, which, if you notice, the economy really took off under Donald Trump. Did really well. The budget paid for The tax cut paid for itself in, in gold. And then we got... Uh, Joey Biden, and it looks like the floor has been pulled out. There's no depth to which we won't sink on all the history there. The last one is the poor did very poorly when you raised taxes on the rich, and the revenues went down. Okay, and that's the use. I could do every state in the nation. My book, uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, the Nature and Cause of the Wealth of States, if any of you want to get it, it's a huge volume of 50 states for 100 years, and the example, which states you do well? Those have no income tax, duh. I mean, you know, what happened to the 11 states that adopted the income tax? Well, they went straight down to the bottom of the heap. And they're the famous ones now, New Jersey, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, Indiana. These are the states, Illinois, 
Those are the states that put in the income tax. Look at how horrible they've done. I mean, the evidence is just overwhelming. Okay, I'm Moeen Bartley. I'm director of the Business School of uh, uh, Hamdard University. It's been fascinating uh, listening to you, uh, pr Professor Laffer. Thank you. So I do uh, get that uh, link that, you know, if you lower taxes and you have uniform taxes over a broader base, then you raise tax revenues. But what troubles me is inequality. And I think this has been documented that inequality has worsened uh, during many, many of these periods. So, uh, you know, I, I do, this is a very, uh, when it was mentioned uh, about, uh, you know, raising tide uh, raises all, all boats. Uh, then of course you have trickle down economics, you know, that's another phrase. So um, uh, that's, that's the, the worry that, uh, you know, the theory is that everybody will benefit, but then if you look at, and this is, ha this is even in the US, the little that, you know, I've, I've yeah, you're read right. about you're it. Right. Uh, a lot of people, they are struggling and, uh, you know, they haven't, they, their lives haven't improved. So how does one okay. tackle this? Th I'm situation? glad you asked, yeah. I, I'd hoped, yeah. I, no, I'm glad you asked that because I'd hoped in my talk that my different parts would, would come together. Uh, when you do the theorem on redistribution, you can come to perfect income equality at zero. What we have found is when we have had more equal income in the United States, it's because you've made the poor, the rich poor faster than you've made the poor poor. All of them going right down to zero. Uh, and that's what's happened with inequality. Inequality diminished dramatically during the Great Depression, during World War II. <clears throat> Everyone got poor. It's just the poor got poor a little slower than the rich got poor. That's not what I want to see. The dream has never been equality. The dream has always been to make the poor richer. It's not to make the poor equally poor. Okay, it's not. The dream is there's nothing wrong with inequality as long as the poor have the chance of becoming richer and have better standard of living, my view of the world. I do not like Ethiopia. I don't want my country to become Ethiopia where everyone is equally poor and diseased and dies. That's not what I want is equality. All right, and I went to the theorem there on redistribution with you. I went to the pillowcase over Bernie Sanders to show you that the socialists, even they respond to incentives. Believe me when I tell you the rich in, in Russia do very well, the government officials. Believe me, Xi does not live in poverty in China. You know, communist governments have inequality of income like everywhere. Uh, Kim Jong-un, uh, his people, even though they're equally poor, they're really in bad shape. To my way of thinking, the dream has to be to make the poor richer. And what you find is when you tax and make enemies of the rich, the poor really suffer. Now the rich suffer too, don't get me wrong. If you hate rich people, you, you would love Biden, you would love Roosevelt, you would love World War II. But I, I don't, I think rich people are wonderful. I just wish I were one. <clears throat> and when you look at rich people, they, I mean, what's wrong with Bill Gates? Nothing. What has he brought to America? Even George Soros, as awful as he is personally, he's done a great job in business. Uh, look at Elon Musk. Do you like these things? Do you like these products? The only thing that makes America different from the rest of the world is our richest little group. Look at all the developments they've brought to this world of ours. You want to kill them all? Is that what you're after? If you hate the rich, you don't want a low-rate, broad-based flat tax. You don't want sound money. You don't want spending restraint. You don't want minimal regulations, and you don't want free trade. You want, Mark, you want Russian policies. You want Chinese policies. That's what you want. And I'm sorry, I'm just not in that category. I love it when these people develop new technologies that make all of us richer. I mean, I love it, and I love rich people. And poor people, I, I want to love more by making them rich. You know, these politicians who profess to love the poor, you've heard them. I love the poor. They love the poor so much that they want to make everyone poor. That's not what I want. 
And if you want that, you, you've got the wrong speaker today. My dream is to make everyone, is, my dream is, I tried to get this correctly for Pakistan, but let me just say it for Pakistan. Uh, you know, the um, Pakistan should be what it could be. What could you, when, if, if I were Bobby Kennedy today and waking up and I, I see what's going on in Pakistan today and I ask why, and I imagine what could happen to, in Pakistan and I ask, why not? Why not the best for you? Why not prosperity for all your kids and your grandkids? What's, what's wrong with that? You think Paul Krugman can give you that? Do you think Janet Yellen can? Georgie Akerlof, he was my classmate at Yale. They were all my classmates. They were all espoused. They've never worked in an area where they've gotten paid. No college professor knows their customer. They get paid by making stupid ideas that everyone clamors over and they all fail and they get promoted. And they're protected by being in tax exempt organizations. In the US, universities are tax exempt. These guys have no, they got tenure, they're tax exempt, they get fixed pay, which is huge. And they tell you how you should run the country. <laughs> and you listen to them. And you follow them and you go, oh yes, he's a professor. <laughs> Come on, please help me on this. You, you've got to break free of it. No university should be tax exempt. It shouldn't be, there's no reason for it. They charge enough tuition, believe me. They shouldn't be, and the professor should be made to produce something good. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm maybe reflecting a little bit of my personal, but these people have never worked in the capitalist system in their lives and they lecture you on it. How can that happen? And here you've got some IRS people, people who know taxes. You know what I'm talking about? Bill, can I do one last one and then quit? You know Warren Buffet, that Frenchman living in Omaha? Warren Buffett. Let me give you his one story, and I'm just gonna tell you the story. It's true, and he, thank God, he displays his tax return. Warren Buffett, in 2011, wrote a letter to the New York Times. He said in the letter that I pay, uh, I pay, uh, I forget what he said, $6.8 million in taxes, which sounds like a lot of money, all right? I pay six point, but as a share of my income, it's a much smaller share of my income than anyone else in my office. I pay less in taxes as a share of my income than anyone else in my office. There are 22 people in his office. And he said, my share of taxes of my income is 17.4%. Now, I'm a math whiz, so. You ready for this? I took his tax bill, which was 6.95, whatever it was, and I divided it by 0.174. And I got his taxable income as being a little less than $40 million. Are you with me? Now that's a lot of money. But then I know that he gives a lot of money away and he's able to deduct from his adjusted gross income 30% 30% of his adjusted gross income he can deduct. So I was able to divide that by 0.7, the 40 million, and I got his adjusted gross income came out to 62 million. <sighs> That's a lot of money, okay, you with me? You all follow me here. This is the true story, and I wrote it in the Wall Street Journal so you can go back and get it anytime you want to. I said 62 million is a lot of dollars, a lot of dollars. But then I said, what is income? Now I'm an economist, I'm a boring, dull, University of Chicago economist. And we have a very clear definition for what income is. Not what the lawyers think, it's not what the IRS thinks. This is what income is. Income is what you spend in a year, what you give away in a year, and the increase in your wealth during that year. Think about it for a little bit. What you spend, what you give away, and the increase in your wealth. So I went back to Warren Buffett's 2010 year. Now Warren Buffett is noted for being frugal. He doesn't spend anything, he's a miser. 
all right? He drives a 10-year-old car that has a broken window and never gets six to bump. So and he eats hamburgers at lunch at the McDonald's. He goes to McDonald's, eats his hamburger. He stays at home. He doesn't travel. He doesn't like French wines or any of that. Doesn't have girlfriends or any of that stuff. So I'm going to assume that his spending was zero. It was more than that, but it's really low. Okay. Then I took uh, Warren Buffett, what he gave away. Now, what I did was I went to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation website where they report these numbers. And in that year, 2010, he gave away $1.75 billion to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Okay, he did. Now, interesting what he said in the conditions. He said the Bill and Melinda have to operate the fund. Number two, they have to spend the money within three years. And if the tax laws changes, I want my money back right away. That was in his conditions on the gift. All right, so he gave 1.75 to Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And then he has two sons who also have 501c3s. He gave a lot of money to them, but they don't have public. He has a daughter he gave to her, their 501c3 too. Lots of money there. His wife has a separate 501c3. He gave to her foundation as well. So he gave the, I, I, I rounded the number up. I think it's a lot more than this, but I rounded it up to two billion. So he gave away two billion that year. He spent nothing, gave away two billion, all right? I then went back to Forbes magazine and I looked at the value of his wealth. Now, fortunately with Bill, with, uh, with Warren Buffett, uh, he owns one thing. He owns that Berkshire Hathaway stock, which by the way is a, an insurance company, it's a tax shelter, you know, all of that, all right? And I looked at Berkshire Hathaway, he had the value of his assets at the beginning of the year, and the value of his assets at the end of the year, and during the year 2010, his wealth went up from 40 billion in Berkshire Hathaway stock to 50 billion. So when I looked at his wealth, his wealth was no spending, uh, he gave away two billion, and his wealth went up by 10 billion. My way of thinking, his income that year was $12 billion. And he paid $6.9 million in taxes, which put his tax bill at something like 0.003% of his income. All perfectly legally, all perfectly fine. I thank God that Warren Buffett had the, had the decency to report these numbers. Now, what do you think would happen to Warren Buffett if I reduced his tax rate to 13% and he had to pay it on his total income? Yeah, he'd take 1.3 and he'd make 12. No, he'd make a lot more than 12. He'd be out hustling. You know, the, the thing is that how do you get Warren Buffett to pay? He's listed as the 47,000th richest, excuse me, highest income man in America. You know he's number one. And all the others, you look at all the people in the Fortune 500, uh, the richest 500, and they all do the same thing. What you want to do is get them not to worry about hiding their income. You want them to get to worry about paying taxes and getting on with making more. Yeah. And that's exactly what will happen here. And the charities he's doing, what are the charities he's doing? <clears throat> oh, is it his son running the charity? Oh, well, that's perfectly, the, the son was hired on a big search of all the competent people that run a charity. And it just so happened that the charity he found that was the best was his son's. Oh, and the other one was his son's too. Oh, and the other one was his daughter's. And the other one was his wife's. Of course they all got sinecures for the rest of their lives. But they're tax deductible. And he went from 62 million in adjusted gross income to 40 million in taxable income to 6.9 million in taxes. And then he says raise taxes. He wants the government to raise taxes on everything he doesn't pay taxes on. That's the truth. But that's the truth of all of them. If they have a low rate flat tax, they won't worry about this junk. They'll just pay their taxes and get on with their business and create prosperity for Pakistan and allow all those babies that were born last year to have hope. Because if you don't do it, who will? I'm through lecturing. Thanks.